Welcome to the Vertical Go-To-Market Podcast, where you'll discover new opportunities to grow your business from seven figures to eight from the world's most successful agency and B2B SaaS executives. I'm your host, Corey Quinn. Let's jump into the show. Today, I'm joined by the CEO and founder of Stitchcraft Marketing, Leanne Presley. Welcome, Leanne. Thanks. I'm excited to be here with you today, Corey. Same here. I'm super excited. Could you please tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, your background for the listening audience? Yeah, sure. So like you introduced, I'm Leanne Presley, and I'm the founder and CEO of Stitchcraft Marketing. It is a niche agency, and we specialize just in crafting companies. And I've been doing that since 2009. We're currently based out of Colorado. That's where I live, but my whole team is virtual. So I've got six on my team and we're scattered all across the United States. And we service mostly B2C companies like yarn shops or quilt shops. Um, But we also do a couple of B2B companies. They might be manufacturers or distributors of yarns or fabrics or tools or anything really related to crafts. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the overview of what we do at Stitchcraft. Cool. We'll double dive into more about the business, but just from a high level for, for a little bit of context, could you share, or what could you share about maybe the size of Stitchcraft marketing? You you mentioned you started in 2009, about 14 years ago, Mm -hmm. Uh, size, number of clients, employees, whatever you're comfortable sharing. Yeah, We're super small, which I love because that allows us to be really nimble and you know, a lot of the bigger agencies that I know, you know, have the problems we don't have because we're so, we're so small, but we are at six employees right now. And my folks work probably 30 hours, 32 hours. So I say they're part-time, but they're almost full-time. You know, we have a culture that really values flex time and family time. So people just, you know, my people don't work 40 hours a week. So we have six of them, and then I got a couple of contractors that do specialized projects for me. And what else? 40, about 40 clients right now. We're ending the year at about 40, and they're all retainer-based programs, most of them. So we're doing the same service for them every single month. As far as size, we're still under a million dollars in gross revenue. But we're, we're growing, growing. And, and like I said, I think we've just kind of found that sweet spot where everybody's happy. We have work-life balance and we're making the money that we need to make to have the lifestyles that we want. So it's just kind of a nice little sweet spot where we're at. Beautiful. I love all that. You mentioned 40 clients on retainer. What type of work specifically are you doing for those businesses? So we specialize in strategy and execution, mostly of social media programs. So when a client comes to us, they're typically in need of some help with their social program. So they might say, gosh, I know I need to be doing Facebook and Instagram posting, but I hate it, or I don't think I'm doing it right, or, you know, what's this retargeting stuff, you know, so they might want some digital advertising component to it. I would say the most common thing we provide is social media strategy. And then we post for them on their social channels. So that might be Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. We also do blogging and newsletters. We'll do some video editing to create the kind of content that goes out on social. And then most of our clients also have a digital ad component to their package. And I would say about 75 to 80% of our clients, that is their core program. It's the strategy and the execution of all those channels. So I tell people we're a full service marketing agency. So if you need web dev stuff or you need branding or logos or any of the services that a typical marketing agency would offer, we do do that, but it's mostly one-offs or you know a client that might need something unusual, not the core. And given the sort of the niche audience, I'm not as familiar with your primary customer. Yeah. When it comes to the B2C clients, what what is the typical size of a company you're working with? Yeah, really small. Our typical client, so at our agency, we always encourage our clients to think about their customer in terms of an avatar, give them a name, give them a personality, describe them to a T. So the avatar for Stitchcraft Marketing is Carol. And Carol is 55 plus, sometimes uh, 65, 62, somewhere above 45, let's say, in age. 
and she is running a shop. She might have a quilt shop or a yarn shop. And like I said earlier, she just is overwhelmed. She's wearing a lot of hats. She's doing too many things on her own. She knows she needs to do a better job with marketing in general and social media specifically. She's not a native. She hates that stuff. She doesn't really want to do it, but she sees her competitor doing it. And so she knows she's got to get on that bandwagon. And so she looks to us to be her hero, you know, to rescue her from the burdens of having to do that kind of marketing. So that's typically the client that comes to us. And so she's small. She might have one shop. We have a couple of clients that are multi shop owners. They might be retailers in multiple States or have a bigger shop or a bigger business, or they're doing brick and mortar and online. So that's the most common client that comes to us is, is a retail shop owner. And like I said earlier, we do service some B2B clients. Um, we work with Bernina a lot, which is a large sewing machine manufacturer. We'll do other distributors, you know, folks that are selling to the retail shop owner. So we have a sprinkling of other types of businesses, but the most common one is, is the shop owner. And are you solving similar problems or challenges for the manufacturers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the messaging is a little bit different, you know, when you're doing a direct to consumer messaging and strategy, it's going to be a little bit different than a wholesaler or distributor that's trying to attract the retailer as their customer. But I'd say in the last five to 10 years, we're really starting to see the manufacturer and distributor coming direct to consumer. So now they are, now they are having similar needs as far as their, their social. So you mentioned, well, let me back up actually. Tell us about your role there as sort of the founder and CEO of this six to seven person agency. What does your day-to-day -day look like? Well, I've really worked hard to try to extract myself from the business as much as possible. So there are days when I am just overseeing the wheels, making sure the wheels are turning and the people on my team are so competent. They're so good that they're the ones really in the trenches doing the work and making, making that happen. So I really am just CEO where I'm overseeing things. Usually what falls into my lap are the things, you know, the more difficult challenges, the HR issues, the client complaints, I call them, you know, the little fires that happen in, in an agency. Those always end up in my lap. You know, the receivable issues, so-and-so's credit card's not going through, or the, you know, this guy's late on payments, you know, all that icky stuff is usually what I have to do the heavy lifting on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the boss's work. Yes. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tell me what was happening in 2009 that, that uh, caused you to realize that, Hey, I wanted to start this business. Like what were you mm. doing at the time? And you know, what was, what was the impetus? Yeah. I mean, I was definitely an accidental agency owner. And I think a lot of agency owners end up in that place. And that was definitely the case for me. So back in 2009, I was working for a company called Interweave Press. They're a publisher of craft magazines and books, and they were in my local community. You know, I had, I had come into the position curious with a degree in writing. And I was an assistant editor there for a few years. And my boss, Deb Robeson at the time, who was a, in, still an incredible spinner, fiber spinner, said to me, if you're going to work here, you got to learn how to knit and you got to learn the fiber crafts. So she's really the one that introduced me to that. And then it just kind of exploded into this monster. And I became obsessed with crafts. Fast forward just a little bit. I worked at Interweave as an ad sales manager for a few years. And in 2009, when the recession hit, my income tanked. I was on 100% commission and I went from paying the mortgage to not paying the mortgage. And I, I kind of panicked and I thought, I got to get off this ship. It's it's sinking. You know, these, these people are not buying print ads, which is what I was selling predominantly. And I found myself on the phone with people talking to them for about an hour about Facebook and about Instagram, about all these things that were new. They didn't, we didn't have Instagram in 2009, but Facebook, you know, and I'd hang up the phone and go, wait a minute. I just spent an hour talking to this prospect about Facebook and they did not buy a print ad. I made $0. And then I quickly realized, huh, everybody just wants to talk about newsletters and Facebook. And so I decided to handpick a couple of clients, people that I was selling ads to. And I actually offered my services for free for about three months. And I said, at the end of three months, well, all I need from you is your feedback. 
What did you like? What worked? What converted for you? What would you actually find value in? What would you be willing to pay me to continue to do? And after those three months, I had a handful of clients that were like, yep, this was great. I would love for you to continue to do my Facebook posting and my newsletters. Those two things I was doing a lot of back in 2009. And so that's how it started. I slowly just started building a very small clientele and offering them services. I was doing it myself. And, you know, it took about six months to a year before I started growing that client base, but that's kind of how it started. And then once my income was enough to support me, I just uh, left the ad sales manager position and did this full time. So, so yeah. were those first couple of clients for the three months, were those primarily people in the crafting yep. kind of they world? Were, they were all people that were buying print ads from me at, okay. at the magazine. Yeah. yeah. So I had already right. had a relationship with them. And I kind of had the door open just a little bit where I could say, hey, I know you're not interested in buying a print ad from me, but are you doing a newsletter? Is that something you need help with? And just found a few that said yes. That's great. Yeah. And so you were able to kind of stay with your current employer as you were sort of testing the waters. You started yeah. to see some some real great results. A couple people said, hey, we'd love to continue with you at that point. You're like, okay, yeah, well, let's let's step let's step into this. Yeah. I mean, I, I was an independent contractor with uh, Interweave at the time. So it was easy for me to kind of, you know, start my own no business problem. on the side and, you know, a little side gig and it, the side gig became the main gig. So again, from the outside, I'm not too familiar with the industry. Clearly, having worked at Interweave, you were becoming or you were very familiar with sort of, I would call that what I would call like the total addressable market, like the, the number of businesses that you could potentially serve. And you were looking at this, it sounds like around like, hey, I'm just going to, oh, let me ask, was, was the intention at the time just to stay within crafting or was it like, I'll see where this goes and then maybe I'll expand to something else at another time. Or was this, was this like, were you intent on staying super focused? Yeah, I was always super focused right from the beginning. I had enough clients that were asking for the work that I, I sort of never got to the end of the road. I never exhausted the prospects to the yeah. point where I had to leave crafts to go somewhere else. I mean, the money just kept coming in. The clients just kept knocking on the door. So at first, you know, I was predominantly in the knitting space, so yarn clients, and I mostly did yarn clients because that's what I knew and that's what I loved. You know, I was not a sewist. I was not a quilter back in 2009, 10, 11. I was just a knitter. So I went to all the fiber shows, all the knitting shows, all the, you know, and so of course, if that's where you are, that's who you're going to prospect. So uh, it wasn't until much later that I expanded within craft to yeah. fabric. And we're at the point now where we're starting to look at other, what we call hard crafts, which would be like woodworking, scrapbooking, paper crafts, things like that. But so far, again, I mean, we just, they keep knocking on the door. So we have not exhausted where we're at in the, in the current markets. How big is the, let's go, let's, let's say the, just within crafting the knitting and yarn sort of domain, how many businesses are there that potentially could hire you? Mm. You know, I should know that number better and it's changing all the time. I, I feel like more and more small businesses are closing, you know, more and more craft companies, uh, ind independent retailers are really struggling. I would say the universe is somewhere between two and 4,000 shops across the United States, you know, and, and as far as B2B businesses, Mm, you know, I, I don't know. There's not a whole lot of great data out there as far as what yeah. the market size is. Yeah. There rarely is, by the way. It's, it's always, rarely uh, is. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Regardless of the industry, even, yeah. even big industries. And, so, yeah. And like I said, we're servicing about 40 clients right now. And I feel like so grateful that we, we have those 40. So, yeah. you know, if the universe is... 2000 or greater, like, I just feel like there's no limit to where we could go with it. That's amazing. I'm doing the quick math. You're at like 2% yeah. of the market share. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. So based on what you're sharing with me, it sounds like you kind of grew the agency organically. You mentioned after about a year, more business started trickling in and where did that new business come from? Was that through you know, an effort to go out and generate new business or was it more just kind of like, like you said, like organically people coming in, they'd heard from 
another, maybe a client that you were doing this work? Like how, what did that look like? At yeah, the that's a good question. So I would say year one and two, I was mostly working the prospect lists from my existing relationships that transferred over from Interweave. You know, yeah. I probably had a client list of a uh, hundred clients that I had been selling print ads to, and that I had been working with in some other capacity. So that really was the list I was working my way through but year one, year two, probably about 2011, 12, somewhere in that neighborhood, I found the Agency Management Institute, which is led by Drew McClellan and really got turned on to his company as a service to agency owners. And so I joined one of the networks. I went to a couple of his workshops and I joined a network and I was in that network for about six years. And in the early years of our network, I was taught everything I needed to know about running an agency. And one of those things that I learned was how to prospect better, where to go to find those other clients. And so one of the big prospecting arenas was the trade show. At the time we had the Needle Arts Association trade show called TNNA. And so once a year I would go and walk the show floor and talk to the vendors there, all the exhibitors who were at the time mostly B2B providers, they weren't the shops. And I picked up a lot of clients there. And you know, those B2B companies had a little more money than the shops did. So in the knitting world, there's just less money overall than there is in the quilting world. So within the knitting world, trying to hit that mid-level B2B type of customer was really where I was aiming. And the best place to find them was at the at that trade show. So that was kind of my one big prospecting event that I did every, once a year. Well, what I love about that, I come from a sales background as well. And so the fact that you were not just sort of waiting for the phone to ring, but you were being strategic and proactive mm -hmm. about going to this trade show and others to seek out people, yeah. conversations, relationships, and all that. That's really great. Yeah. I mean, I think there was a real shift and I think new agency owners will find this to be true that in the very beginning, when people are still learning who you are and they're getting to know you and learn about you and trust you, there's a lot more outbound. I had to do the outreach. I had to pound the pavement to find those clients. I had to ask for the referrals. I had to dig, 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 dig to find those clients. And then there's a tipping point, probably, you know, two thirds into the lifespan of my agency. We really got turned on more to inbound marketing. And again, kudos to Drew and his knowledge and his expertise in mentoring me as a member of the network, how to do inbound marketing. And once we really put our foot on the gas with inbound and developed ourselves as a domain authority in the space, that really changed everything. And now I, I definitely still do go to trade shows, but now it's like a flywheel and all of the business just comes in through that channel. I don't have to do cold calling. I don't have to do a lot of outreach. It's all inbound. So let's dig into that a little bit. Sure. So when you when when you you mentioned two two thirds of the way through your sort of agency lifestyle, there was a dynamic change between mm -hmm. outbound and kind of really being more of a hunter type of mentality. That's my word, not right? yours, but kind of yeah. going out and working the list, working the trade shows. But then at a certain point, the, the the energy kind of changed where it's now coming inbound. And it sounds like part of that is because you started doing some thought leadership. Exactly. Is that, yeah. is that, some, is that fair? Yeah. I mean, we, we really learned more about how to do that. And, and um, once we started establishing ourselves as a thought leader in the space and really building up that, that authority in the space and I would say the bits and pieces of that, I know your listeners are probably like, well, what does that mean? So it means, you know, we found ourselves in more speaking positions. So I would go to the trade show and instead of just walking the show floor, I would be a speaker. You know, I would work my way into the, the, the speaker board and get us get an hour slot talking about something important, you know, how to post on social media or best practices or whatever the topic was. So here I am standing in front of 300 people. I'm the expert. And then after the presentation, they're all flooding the podium going, I've got questions. I, we want to work with you. You obviously know what you're talking about. Well, we need somebody who knows what they're doing. You know, so now I'm the expert and now I'm the authority in that space. And we just replicated that across the board. We did tons of, I do tons of speaking, tons of public engagements. We had a lot of outbound marketing materials. So we did tons of white papers, lots of outbound newsletters with really high quality content lots of automations. We did a lot of, you know, video. I had a podcast, just, you know, 
continuing outbound, 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 outbound on trying to be the expert on a variety of topics that we wanted to be hired for. And I would say within a year, definitely by two years, it, it worked. I mean, that's, that's when I started to see the flywheel really start to spin. Hey, it's Corey. Almost every day I talk with agency owners who are frustrated with getting their outbound program off the ground. The truth is too many agencies are too dependent on inbounds and referrals to grow their business. We all know that it's getting harder and harder to generate inbounds and that it's just not a sustainable way to grow your business. I'd like to give you the six secrets for driving consistent ROI from your outbound that I learned as Scorpion's chief marketing officer, where we doubled the business from 20 million to 40 million just by adding outbound to an existing inbound only program. It's a free six day email course that will transform your outbound from broken to consistently driving new sales opportunities. You could sign up and get the first secret right now by going to get outboundroi.com that's get outboundroi.com now back to the show any tips for agency owners who would want to be on more stages at conferences like what does a conference organizer care about or what they're looking for in in a presenter mm. I think one of the things that helped us was to have little snippets of me speaking just on our YouTube channel and or on a website page for people that were interested in hiring speakers. I did do some outbound cold calling to uh, some businesses that I knew had a stage. You know, it wasn't just the trade show, but I targeted, you know, there's a couple of companies. Bernina was one that I already mentioned. They'll they'll do like a retailer education seminar once a year. So all their retailers come to a central location and Bernina sponsors an educational summit, if you will, teaching the retailers about a variety of different things. And one of those things is business acumen. So I became the person that would teach about social media and, and now I teach every single year at the same event. Same thing for Handy Quilter, which is a company that makes long arm quilting machines and then also the other trade shows. So I'll, I'll get some stage time on some of the other trade shows. And, you know, I think it's like anything else. You start small, you get your foot in the door with one, then you use the content and the video recording from that one to pitch number two, and then number two turns into number three. And, you know, slowly you've got, you've got a lot of stage time. Yeah. You mentioned newsletters was another thing that you have done. It's been helpful. What, yeah. uh, tell us about your newsletters. What, what are they and how did you grow the list? We started with just a monthly outbound send, really talking about what we were seeing in the marketing and social media landscape that we thought would be of value to our clients. So, you know, anytime there's a change on Facebook or, you know, what we're talking about right now is a lot of AI and also within the craft industry, things that we're seeing that are effective or changes that are happening in the industry in general. Again, we wanted to be the place where people would rely on us for, you know, their news and their happenings and so on. It's not very long. It's uh, a lot of links back to other long form content, other articles are on our blog that will give them more content or information about that. And we grow the list by just offering something super valuable in that newsletter. You know, I think a lot of people don't do that. They put the same content that they have on their blog or that's readily available on the website. And we try to reserve our very, very best juicy nuggets for the newsletter. And so that, that tends to drive traffic and signups. So you mentioned podcast. Are you still doing the podcast? Yes, I am. Okay. Okay. I'm at a place now where I do it seasonally. I, sure. I was doing it every other week for a long time and that just became too much for me. So now I just break it into seasons and each season I'll do seven or eight shows. I take a break, right. come back with fresh new guests. So I do a spring yeah. and a fall season and that seems to really work. And what is the the nature of the podcast? Like who who is your ideal listener and, and, and how did that start and mm -hmm. how is it going? Yeah. Our ideal listener is Carol. I mean, we're always we're mm -hmm. always marketing to Carol. Love that. And Carol needs her problems solved. So any expert that can come on the show that can help Carol solve that problem, we try to aim for timely or targeted types of topics and just find the, the experts on that. So 
you know, for example, this last season, we had somebody come on and talk about data analytics because we know Carol is terrible with analytics and she doesn't look at her data and she doesn't understand her data. So, you know, we had an expert come on and hold her hand and walk her through how to find your Google analytics, what to look for, what are the important metrics. So we try to do that with really every area that Carol might be interested in. It might be retailing, merchandising, it might be tax saving strategies. It might be, you know, something new or different with Facebook. It might be best practices. I mean, there's a lot of topics that Carol yeah. needs help with. So, And is it primarily you're interviewing third parties or are you ever sort of doing a solo cast? No, I usually interview a guest. Yeah. Yeah. So you bring in the expert. Yeah. The, fu the functional expert in this one specific area. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. That sounds like a very yeah. high value podcast for your listeners or for Carol, I should say. Yeah, for Carol. And then this year, we actually did one other thing that I think really helped us with our domain authority is we partnered with Audience Audit, which is a company that does research for agencies led by Susan Beyer. And Susan helped us do an industry-wide piece of research. So this year we did research on retailers and it's an attitudinal segmentation study. And that was fantastic because we got really awesome stage time at the trade show. We got keynote spots and so on. And then Beautiful. now that became content for the podcast and really tons of other stuff. We learned so much about Carol and now we really understand what her pain points are. And so now I craft all of our outbound content knowing that we have the solution and we understand yeah. what Carol's pain points are. So I would say that's another kind of thing I would highly recommend for agencies that are struggling with their niche or they're, they're not the domain authority. That's a really great way to, to get that quickly is come up with some research, do some industry research. I'd like to underline that I've, I've had similar experience in my agency background yeah. in that not only is it more compelling to come with data, like market data, but it tends to get picked up more mm -hmm. by the PR machine yep. because you know folks are looking for not just opinion pieces, looking for hard data that they can reference yep. for their own purposes. Yep. By the way, I'm, I'm interviewing Susan from Audience Audit awesome. on my podcast here soon. I can't wait for oh, that conversation. Oh, great. People really yeah. should... Yeah. Mark their calendar for that one because she's yeah. brilliant and she holds the key, I think, to helping niche agencies really skyrocket their domain authority. I mean, it, it did for us. We actually are in talks to do some more research, partnering with one of our vendors that mm -hmm. learned a lot from the retailer and now they want to do a consumer study. So again, that just helped us snowball that authority and it's been wonderful. Yeah, and, and a quick shout out to Drew McClellan, who introduced us, yeah. introduced uh, me and Susan as well. Thank you, Drew, for this wonderful yes. introduction. When it comes to hiring, do you feel or do you, have you had to hire for um, hire employees when you're six employees, current or past, with a specific background in crafts? Was that a priority mm -hmm. for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the selling points that we put forth, one of one of our value propositions is you want to hire us because we speak your language. We know, and the example I always give, which your listeners might be like, huh, I don't understand that. But if you were a crafter, you would, under, you would know the difference between an H hook and a knitting project. So an outside generalist agency would put up an Instagram post showing a crochet hook and a knitting project. And we say, you know, we know the difference between a crochet hook and a knitting needle. So we speak your language and we really understand the nuance of all these crafts. And it's, it's definitely true. I mean, once clients start working with us, I hear that feedback all the time where they're like, oh, it's so refreshing that I don't have to explain all this to you. <laughs> and so it is really important that our employees also do the crafts speak the language. I encourage my employees to do multiple crafts because an, an account manager might be working on a knitting client and a sewing client. So yeah. yeah, that's definitely part of our culture that we nurture on a regular basis is crafts, 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 crafts. Is that true across all roles or are there some roles that are more important to have someone with a specialty background in crafts mm. for your for your agency? All, all roles for us, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. 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 Have you ever employed a salesperson? You know, not specifically as one role, you know, my, my AEs are all 
amazingly talented and understand how to s upsell an existing client. So I would say, you know, their sale sales role is always trying to help that client solve their problems. And, you know, if there's an opportunity to offer a service that does solve that problem, then that's, yeah. that's wonderful. I happen to love, love, love sales. So I'm always the one <laughs> Me too. raising my hand. I'm like, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. You know, yeah. I, yeah. I just love it. I live for it. So I've just always fallen into that role myself. Do you productize your agency services? Yes, mm -hmm. we do. And then how did that, was that always the case or how did that evolve over time? How did you figure you know, out the packages? It, and whatnot? It, it wasn't always the case. Well, let me say yes and no. I would say that we have a core set of services that are replicated from client to client. We used to be the kind of agency that would do anything and everything. So if a client came to me and said, oh, we would like you to do this very obscure service that you guys don't do on a regular basis, would you do it? And I would go, oh yeah, absolutely. I don't know if I know how to do it, but yes, I'm going to sell that to you. I'm going to say yes. And then we would get in trouble down the road because we didn't have the skill set. We didn't have the expertise. We didn't have had, an, had enough experience to really crush it with that service. And so it was actually Drew who was teaching me. I think he refers to it as the artisan bakery versus the bread factory. We moved away from being that specialty bread maker, you know, the one that does rye bread and sourdough bread. Oh, and we make bagels and we do chocolate croissants. And do you want a muffin? Oh, I'll make you a muffin. We moved away from that to we have three kinds of bread. You can have this one, this one, or that one. And if you want the specialty bagels, I'll refer you to someone else that does that really, really well. And so I, I think that's helped us too. You know, you might think that you're turning away all this other business, the folks that want the muffins, but in reality, it's really just made us even more honed in and more expert at the, the three types of bread that we do offer. So what we do is when a client comes to us, we'll do what we call a strategic analysis, which is a deep dive piece of research into their business. We want to understand what they're doing well, what they're not doing well. So we do a whole analysis and then we come back to them with a 90 minute presentation on what we found. And then the proposal piece, where if they want to engage the agency, that's customized based on what we saw in the research. And typically we're choosing from, going back to the metaphor, those bread options. So sure. makes sense. It, it's, I mean, a, they, it's a did. select offering, but it's customized to each sure. client. Yeah. Tell us about your mastermind. So the mastermind is a group of retail business owners. I'm on my third round with the same group. So we have six folks in the mastermind. And like I said, this is the third time that we've done it. We do it for about uh, 12 weeks and they come together once a week and we do two different things. One, one week in the month, I teach a topic. And again, it's something I know Carol is struggling with or the mastermind members have specifically requested. I do like a 10, 15 minute teaching lesson with a slide deck about it. And then we have discussion about it. And then the opposite week, the second week of the month, we do what I call a challenge round. And the challenge round is they're bringing their bite-sized problem to the group and we break it all apart and ask questions and dissect it all. And then hopefully that retailer goes away with, oh gosh, I've got tons of new ideas on how I can solve the problem. So that's, that's awesome. kind of the two features yeah. of the mastermind. How did it start? What was the inspiration behind it? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. I think it really originated from just how much value I got from being part of a professional network. And actually some of the concept I stole from Drew, which is that challenge round component. He does that in the networking groups where every agency owner comes, comes with a problem and then the other agency owners help them to dissect it and break it apart and hopefully come up with a solution. So I did borrow that from my experience being in a network. I just, I've gotten so much value out of, out of being part of a professional group that I thought mm, there's gotta be some people that want help with this. And also it, be, it was just another lower price point entry point for clients yeah. that couldn't afford the retainer based fee. The mastermind was an affordable way that they could get some consulting and come into the inner circle of Stitchcraft at a lower price point. 
And as it turns out, everybody that's in my mastermind right now has at some point become a client. So they've <laughs> onboarded to be, you know, they're drinking the Kool-Aid sure. and now they're all clients. So yeah. uh, that yeah. was also a really awesome conversion tool. That's great. That's a great testimonial. Kind of, kind of um, stepping back to more of a global look at the, you know, the business, you've been in business for 14 years. There's certainly some agency owners who may be somewhere on their journey. They're probably some of them who are generalists today. They've, yeah. They see the value of verticalizing and they're tempted to do that. With that frame in mind, what are the, in your mind, the positive aspects of verticalizing an agency business? Well, I got to tell you, Corey, I've never known different. I've only okay. known life in the niche. And I, I mean, I just am the biggest fan of that. I, I, a love being in the space that I'm passionate about. I, I have the privilege of waking up every day and thinking about my hobbies, thinking about my passions and the things that juice me up creatively. You know, if I was niching in some other industry that I didn't really care anything about, I might not be as excited about it, but I've been able to combine those two things. So for me, that's the number one thing is if you can find a niche that you're genuinely passionate about and interested in, then can I ask a follow up question on yeah, that? So, sure. would your advice to one of these agency owners is looking at sort of the landscape of different verticals to go after? How important is it that they actually have a a care like they enjoy that vertical or that that craft or that that medium? Yeah. How important is that? I mean, can you can an agency owner be successful and just being like more of a transactional kind of? I mean, approach. I think it's obvious that it, you know, you're, you're curious and interested in the things that you're passionate about, you know? So, and it doesn't feel like you're working. I mean, what's that old adage that, you know, if you find something, the work you love, then you never work a day in your life or yes. whatever that is. I, that's true yeah. for me. And even in my, you know, my spare time, like last week here, my local town had a fiber festival and, you know, I'm like, gotta go to work, you know, gotta go to the fiber <laughs> festival and shop for yarn, you know, like, sorry, honey, I'll be home at the end of the day. You know, it's stuff like that where I'm like, pinch myself like, oh gosh, I get to spend the whole day at the fiber festival and it's work. So yeah, I, I would encourage people, you know, it's just human nature. You're going to be more invested in something that you're naturally curious and interested in about. What about the negatives? Have you ever said to yourself, gosh, this, this vertical or this niche is just, you know, not working out or, you know, any, any you know, kind of challenges? Well, I feel like crafts chose me in a way and you know there was not an intentional choice about oh I'm going to niche which niche am I going to choose I'm passionate about crafts I'm going to pick crafts you know I fell into it because I love it and so some of the downsides are you know when I was in the networking group for example you know I would sit at a table with other agencies and look at their financials and think oh my gosh they're charging what how much are they getting for, you know, the same services I'm providing? They were making three times the amount because they were able to charge more because those businesses had more money and deeper pockets. And crafts has never been at that same caliber. It's just, you know, my clients don't pay what other agencies are able to get from their clients for the same work. So yeah, that's a little bit of a downside that the pockets just aren't as deep and they just don't have as much to spend. You know, if I had picked some other niche that was more lucrative, maybe that would have made my path easier, but I, I doubt it. I rarely am envious of those bigger agencies. And actually it seems like even when they had bigger revenue numbers, their profits weren't as big, their margins weren't as big. In fact, I've always had better margins than a lot of people that were at the same table. And then the other benefit, the other upside is I have not struggled as much with employees. Some of those bigger generalist agencies, I think have bigger turnover uh, because an AE can work for generalist A and then job hop over to generalist B and C and D, you know, those skills really translate. Whereas me, my employees are so thrilled that they get to work in their craft, in the what they're passionate about. I think for a lot of my employees and people that have worked for me, that comes first, is the privilege yeah. to be able to wake up every day and think about yarn or think about quilting or think about the industry. They love that part first. So I've just had an easier time cultivating culture 
and employee retention. My longest legacy employee right now is going on 12 years with me. So my people stay and it's just a lot easier to retain them. So I would say that's another upside of, of niching is if you can find those employees that are also equally as passionate about whatever your niche is, it's easier to cultivate that culture. That's awesome. Yeah. Last question yeah. for you. What's your motivation? What's my motivation? Well, I say that I, I mean, I've really come to a place where I am sincerely and genuinely passionate about the industry. And when I see people struggling or the industry as a whole struggling, I do feel personally compelled to do what I can and lend my expertise to raise all ships. So that's what I usually say is our agency exists to help Carol sincerely and genuinely do a better job being a business owner because I want those craft shops. I want to be able to go into my local neighborhood yarn shop and buy yarn locally. So I need to make sure I'm doing what I can to support Carol so that tomorrow she's not put out of business by the big box stores or that, you know, that she exists and that crafts in general. I mean, I just feel like as far as culturally speaking, the handcrafts and being able to be a maker and make something with your hands, it, it, there's fundamentally a beautiful thing. We all need more of that in our lives, you know, that tactile experience. And I don't know, here I am, I'm going to go off now, but you know, the, the process of making your own clothing or making a quilt that keeps you warm and the community connection that we have in our industry, like I just, I feel in my heart, like I just want to do whatever I can to help the industry grow and thrive and be here tomorrow. Well, I can tell that that's a true, authentic statement for you based yeah. on our conversation today. And yeah. that's clear to me why you're so successful with this venture. So it's, yeah, that's thanks, beautiful. Yeah, thanks, Corey. Yeah. Where can people reach out to you if they want to connect with you, if they wanted yeah. to follow up with any questions? Yeah, and I would encourage people to do that. I'm open arms when it comes to helping other agency owners, especially. My website is stitchcraftmarketing.com, and we do have a contact form there. Just click on that navigation and fill out the form, and I'll reply back to you via email. Beautiful. Thank you so much for joining, Leanne. Yeah, thanks, Corey. It was a real pleasure. All right, folks, that's it for today. I'm Corey Quinn, and I hope you join me again next time for the Vertical Go-To-Market Podcast. If you receive value from the show, I would love a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks, and we'll see you soon.